Hello, my name's Fergus Halliday and I'm a tourist guide here in Scotland. If you're interested in the history and the landscape of our country, then why not join me and I'll show you around. Today, we'll be following in the footsteps of the ruthless, scheming families that inspired Game of Thrones, as well as cattle rustlers and brigands and the firebrand preachers of the National Covenant, as we follow the Thieves' Road up into the Pentland Hills. Last time, we came around the reservoir to the dam, and now it's time to head up into the hills along the Thieves' Road proper, all the way to Cold Stain Slap. It's got to be one of my favourite place names. The slap comes from slope, meaning a mountain pass, and you'll see quite a few dotted around Scotland. The route we're walking along today is the main route from the fruitful central belt for cattle to drive all the way across the English border into the market towns of northern England. Tens and thousands of cattle would be driven annually, as well as around 30,000 sheep in the opposite direction, coming up from the borders to the market towns in Falkirk and Lanark. Of course, as well as the cattle and the farmers, the road is used by thieves and brigands. In 1600, a group of Armstrongs and Scots rustled 80 head of cattle up the road as hard as they could away from the farmers, leaving many dead and wounded by the wayside. Walking through all the boggy ground, speaking to camera with the sun in your eyes, is not the best way to do this route. Oop. Of course, I didn't listen to my own advice, and a short way up the path, I took one misstep into the sphagnum moss, all the way up to my knee. Thanks, universe. <laughs> oh, no. As my wet trousers began to chafe, it did get me thinking about how practical kilts that stop at the knee are while traipsing through the wet heather. Not even my Gore-Tex gaiters could prevent the damp clinging to my calves. I wasn't taking any chances anymore, so gratuitous slow-mo jumps from now on. With the advent of rail and steam, these routes became less and less trodden, but you can still see in parts along the route the original parallel dikes, wide enough for several cattle alongside one another, that stopped the herd from straying too far off the trail. As we climb higher up the slopes, in and out of the shadow of the hills, and nearer to Coldstain Slap, you realise how cold and remote this place could be on a less sunny day, as the name might suggest. But this wasn't just the refuge of thieves, it was also the site of a conventicle in 1684. But what is a conventicle? Now, to tell this story requires a bit of background, because it is quite complicated. King James VI of Scotland was baptised a Catholic, but was a lifelong Protestant, and in 1603 inherited the crown of England as well. Now, that meant he had two separate kingdoms with different political structures and different churches, and he wanted more unity. As king in England, that meant he was the head of the Anglican Church, whereas in Scotland under the Presbyterian Kirk, he was just another member of the congregation. The Anglican Church has a hierarchy quite similar to that of the Catholic Church, with bishops and archbishops and the like, whereas the Presbyterian Kirk is run by the General Assembly and is a much more flat system. In trying to achieve unity, King James favoured the Anglican model. With him as the head of the Kirk, it gave him more control, and if there's one thing that Stuart Kings like, it's being in charge. He imposed multiple changes that divided the General Assembly and brought in a more Episcopalian church. His son, Charles I, also imposed more changes. But despite being born in Scotland, the last king crowned at Schoon, and having a Scottish accent, he really did not understand the country. On the 28th of February, 1638, in Greyfriars Kirkyard in Edinburgh, the National Covenant was written and signed. It outlined the Church's direct covenant with God, that they were God's chosen people, 
there was no need for bishops and archbishops and any of this popery that was heresy to the Presbyterian Kirk. Ministers took it out to their congregations and some 16% of the entire country signed the document, whether they'd written their name before or it was the first time with a pen in their hand. The document also outlined a constitutional monarchy that limited the power of the king in law. This stood against everything that Charles I had been practising. Many in Scotland took up arms and the Covenanters seized control both of the General Assembly and of the Scottish Parliament. This time was known as the Rule of the Saints, in which there were harsh punishments for committing acts of popery. In 1643, the Covenanters went one step further. They wrote a document known as the Solemn League and Covenant, which went much further than the National Covenant had before, outlawing anything even remotely Catholic all the way down to choristers. Taking up arms alongside Oliver Cromwell against the King, the Covenanters eventually captured King Charles in battle Trying to force him to sign the National Covenant, he refused. And so they handed him over to Oliver Cromwell and the Parliamentarians, who executed him in 1649 for treason. Now it's fair to say that the Scottish Parliament weren't best pleased that their king had been executed in the hands of a foreign parliament without any consultation on their behalf. In negotiations with his heir, Charles II, they forced him to sign the National Covenant and so declared him king. And Oliver Cromwell took that somewhat personally. He rallied his forces and occupied Scotland for many years. But it didn't last too long. And in 1660, both the English and Scottish parliaments, at the end of Oliver Cromwell's dictatorial government, crowned Charles II King of Scotland and England. Following Charles II's restoration, the Episcopalians took full control of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, and the Parliament, fearful of the people who had brought around the death of their king, proscribed and criminalised the Covenanters. Of the thousand ministers in Scotland, only 262 refused to take this new vow to Charles II. They boarded up their churches, took their congregations, and headed off into the hills to hold their services amongst the heather. It's these secret covenanting services in the hills that were known as conventicles. The Tennant family, who bought the tower and the estate from the Crichtons in the last episode, were likely involved, hence their rebuke in the record for religious nonconformity. In 1684, the preacher here was a man named James Rennick. Born in Dumfrieshire, he'd studied at Edinburgh University and had witnessed the hangings of the ministers who'd refused to take Charles II's oath. A man of faith, of strong faith, he'd seen these martyrs and thought that was the future for him. He travelled abroad to Groningen to become an ordained minister and returning to Scotland, quote, full of zeal and breathing forth threats of assassination, he took up the fight against the king. He and his supporters marched into the town centre of Lanark, brandishing copies of the Act of Parliament that named the king's Catholic brother James the heir to the throne. This was totally unacceptable for the Covenanters. James declared that Charles II had turned court into a brothel. He demanded a return to the rule of the saints and took hammers, tearing down the Mercat Cross. Unfortunately for James, Charles II soon died of a stroke. Before anything could be done, James VII was crowned king. James Rennick rallied some 6,000 followers. In his own words, he described them as a poor, wasted, wounded, afflicted, bleeding, misrepresented and reproached remnant. They were ready to be martyrs. <laughs>
while he never took up arms himself, unlike many other Covenanters, including his own followers, he continued to defy the law holding conventicles. The price on his head was £100, dead or alive. That's eleven and a half grand in today's money. A letter from a busybody to the local general Thomas de Yell, ominously known as Bloody Tam, read, Sir, having received information of a conventicle kept at Cairn Hill upon the first instant, and another at Colston Slope, where several men were in arms and diverse women present, we desire your excellency to give such orders for discovery of these persons and apprehending them, and of the heritors on whose ground the conventicles were kept, as you shall think fit. The laird down at the Cairns Tower could well be in trouble. But James Rennick's luck eventually ran out. Staying at a smuggler's inn on Castle Hill in Edinburgh, he was overheard at evening prayers by a customs officer who recognised his preaching. He waited until morning and ambushed him as he woke. James fended him off with a pistol, making his way and escaped down to the Cowgates before he was eventually captured. As a valuable prisoner, they wanted him to recant his beliefs, but he refused to sign a pardon and on the 17th of February 1688 was hanged in the grass market, preaching until the last second. He got the martyr's death that he wanted. As I stand on one of the rocks that James Rennick could have preached from and dissolve away in a cliched metaphor for time passing, it's easy to imagine his voice rising over the impassioned crowd and echoing off the slopes. Even today, the hill down to the north beside the path is known as the Temple Hill. James Rennick was the last covenanting martyr. A matter of months after his head was displayed on a spike above the Edinburgh city gates, William and Mary were invited by seven English nobles to invade and depose the Catholic King. In November 1688, they took control of the English Parliament. And in Scotland, the moderate covenanters struck a deal with the new monarchs and were welcomed back into the General Assembly. To cap off the walk, it's time to head to the top of East Cairn Hill. As well as the spectacular views across the central belt, there's a Bronze Age burial cairn to have a peep at. These ancient stones have stood here for over 3,500 years, millennia before the Crichtons schemed their way into royal favour, before cattle were preyed on by the brigands of the hills, and before James Rennick roused his reproached remnant into action. It's been heavily rebuilt by walkers for centuries. By the time archaeologists got here, there wasn't much left besides an arrowhead and a couple of human bones. Now, it's a marker for the passage of time. It stood here for millennia, looking over the landscape as it's changed, and will continue to change inexorably on into the future. Thanks for coming along on this walk today. If you've enjoyed it, then please do give it a like below, and keep an eye out for the next instalment wherever it may be.